Welcome listeners. I am feeling super blessed today for a couple of reasons. One of them is I have an internationally recognized specialist on narcissism. And I um, have never had anyone on my podcast talk about narcissists. And I think it's, I know, can you believe it? And I've been doing this for about a year and a half. So I'm so excited that I have Tracy Malone, the author of Divorcing Your Narcissist. You can't make this shit up. (laughs) I can't think of a better title. And I'm so excited to get to know you better and learn from you. So we're going to have you share your story. And then I'm going to ask a couple questions about how you know someone's a narcissist and can you mediate with a narcissist. But there's one other special thing about this episode, which I rarely do. I have a current client who is going through the very difficult situation of a divorce with a narcissist. And she isn't showing her face and we're calling her Lisa's client, but she has some questions for you, Tracy. So at the end, we're going to let her pop in and ask her questions. So I am just so thrilled to have you here. And Tracy, can you share with my listeners how you got into this line of work? Um, Well, basically the word above my head is Sir Thriver. (laughs) So I was a Sir Thriver of narcissistic abuse. Um, I went through a torturous divorce about 10 years ago. Um, The judge called it the most tortured divorce in our town's history. I had no idea why we had seven trials. We were fighting over fifty thousand dollars. That was house was already sold. That's the profit. Split it. Have a nice day. And it became a war, and it was a war to financially ruin me. And they succeeded. Um, my divorce cost a hundred thousand dollars to fight for my twenty five, which was in escrow with the lawyer. So they just got that, and then another seventy five. I was in debt to them, and. Um, I had no idea was what was going on. I honestly didn't understand. I had been divorced once before. We agreed on things, set at a table, mediated. He went into court, stamped it, had a nice day. That was like what I expected. Mm-hmm. This was torture. Um, and all the false allegations and the lies. And I didn't understand where that was coming from. Still didn't know. But I had a therapist who I was under treatment with. And I was like, do you know anything about this? And he said, oh, they like to look in the mirror. I was like, that's not exactly what a narcissist is, sir. But um, <laughs> had he known, I would have been in a much better place during that divorce process. And um, I didn't really know about narcissists until a couple years later after dating a uh, narc too. He was really a, a, a extremely toxic person. And um, I found out he was cheating and went to forgive him about three months later after church and a forgiveness sermon. So he called the police and had me arrested. So I went to jail and when I got out, someone said, look up gaslighting, that's what he's doing. And I was like, what's that? So my life unfolded and I started support groups for myself, (laughs) still learning about it. And they blossomed into about 60 or 70 people a month. And I just kept learning and learning. And I finally said, okay, enough bitching here. We've got to like heal. So I started to teach them the things I was learning about healing. And um, that's how I learned. So I I enmeshed myself for my own recovery, not only for that jerk, but then also the divorce, it explained everything. And then, but why me comes up, you know, six months later, I'm still reeling going, oh, why me? How could this happen? And and the truth was to be found that I was raised by narcissistic parents. Mm. Both my sisters are narcissists. Oh my gosh. And I was just normalized to the crazy. I really was. I, I didn't know that ghosting wasn't normal. To me, that was family vacation. They'll be back. You know, the lies, the things that you hear and stuff was just something I, I just knew as, as like, that's how we live. I didn't know that that wasn't normal. So it gave word to everything. And then I just kept on healing and kept on helping people and eventually opened my coaching door to victims. And then the divorce just kind of led its path because of the the groups and things that I have, the more I worked with people for years and years, I go, Oh, that's what they're going to do. That's what they're going to do. And the book was born. (laughs) 
And that book, I mean, it's so good. I recommend it for anyone, even though I'm not in the middle of divorcing a narcissist. There are things in here that are really eye-opening. And I'm wondering, do you find that it's common? You said you weren't aware of this in your life. And do you think that that's true for a lot of people who are going through this? And then they suddenly they're ending the marriage and boom. You know, you said, I think I heard you say you didn't expect it to go the way that it did. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I, I believed the story, right? Narcissists create this story, this persona. We call it a mask. Um, and I bought it hook, line and sinker. So I truly believe because I have it on recordings because we went to group, you know, couples counseling. Oh, well, I'll be good to her. I would never do anything. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I truly believe that I had no idea what was going to happen. And, and, and my divorce was really run by his parents, um, who are wealthy and out to get blood. Mm. So, um, you know, they just, he quit his job. It, it, you can't make that shit up. There's so many things that he did um, and the accusations that were flying and, you know, just having to play defense. So, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think most people don't know it until they are faced with it. Someone says to them, it sounds like a narcissist. And, you know, they start to do the deep dive that I did. And just most people who get on my screen are newcomers to understanding this. Okay, so that was something I was going to ask you. So most of the people, so if people listening to this are wondering and want help, they can contact you. And we're going to give you that information at the at the end. But that's so helpful. So you help people when they're first starting out. Do you have people that you're helping um, who they're, they're trying to heal from it? Like maybe it's been years back because I bet that's hard too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And also there's always, I'm not saying there's always, I'd say there's a 96% happening that what happened to me happens to them, which is, oh my God, it was my family. Oh my God, I, I had this boyfriend. Oh my God, I had it in my past. It like we're repeat offenders because the normalized crazy that I lived was what I thought was normal. Right. So right they also went through this. So there seems to be a tie to some family or some origin that they never put two and two together. All we always said was my family was crazy. Okay. That's <laughs> Which every family's a little crazy, right? Exactly. You know, I mean, you know, but what was interesting for, for our family was that, um, we lived in, in Westport, Connecticut, which is this waterfront town. Our house was on the water. We had a big yacht, the, the public persona, of what our family was, was so not what it was, but that was what they were selling. If I would say, how come we don't go on vacations like other families? They're like, Burr. you know, they, they right. were cruel and heartless. And um, again, but you live a good life. You live on the water. Shut up, kid, was what right. I was, you know, and so, okay, all right, that's fine. Okay, so it, this is kind of leading into, I said I had a couple questions for you. Mm -hmm. My first one, and I honestly tried to do a little research, how do you know that someone's a narcissist? Because is it true when I read through like the red flags and, and the information, some people can have some characteristics? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So can you clarify that a little bit for me? On sure. So, so there are several different types of narcissists. So the overt, which is sort of the grandiose, the, the one that you can see it like they're flamboyant and loud and need all the attention. Um, then there's the covert, which is what most people that don't see this had. Um, a covert narcissist is one who has, they, they all have a, a, an amazing public persona that they've built and they lie about, but the covert doesn't do things quite as obvious. They're a little bit more subtle and, and the, the passive aggressiveness is sort of more the weapon than the grandiose and the, the overt narcissist. There's just a whole bunch of them. Um, but what I tell people is when we're looking and I'll, I'll go over some of the characteristics to look for, but, um, I, I actually hold up my rubber stamp and I say, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter if we give them a stamp or not. If you can check 80 things on my checklist. We don't need someone to go to the doctor and get diagnosed. We are treating you because of the things they're doing to you. 
And so again, the right. name is getting you to answers and they always like, Oh my God, that's what I needed to hear. So, um, you know, we don't care what we call them, but as a general rule, there's, there's a bunch of things in the DSM, which is a grandiose self, um, sense of self-importance, exaggerates achievements, believes that they're special, requires excessive admiration and validation, and they are entitled. But that is like the dumbest explanation for the DSM-5, <laughs> which is the, the, the Diagnostical Statistical Manual for all therapists and, and psychologists to get that. This is a narcissist. Check, check, check. Six things. I'm like, no, the reality is that they use false love to manipulate people and they are selfish. They have no ability to feel shame, empathy, or guilt. So therefore, they can do whatever they want. And it doesn't matter if you've been married to them for 30 years. You know, you're just like pawn scum to them once you've gone into this black and white thinking. Um, they use tactics like lying. They lie about everything. Um, those covert narcissists are so charming that everybody comes to the, the victim and says, oh, but your husband, your wife was so charming. Oh, we loved her so much, right? That's the public image. So they're putting right. out that. Um, they gaslight and gaslighting is a, another sort of form of lying where they are um, basically telling you that what you saw, thought or heard didn't happen. So you start to go a little crazy, like, right. no, I'm pretty sure you said we were doing this. No, I didn't, you know. And so the gaslighting is a way to manipulate your mind so that you lose who you are and lose what you believe. So you stop believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, most people don't do that. Um, during the divorce, they often use the children as weapons. Narcissists do not care about children only to the extent that they are on their arm to show people with the picture of the white shirts and the blue jeans behind their desk. Look, I'm normal. I have one of those pictures. Um, you know, look, my kids got straight A's. So they like to boast about them. But behind closed doors, they're evil and horrible to their children. And children grow up with this feeling never good enough. So it's kind of a, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, okay, yeah. so you you just said that they're evil to their children inside closed doors. That's mm -hmm. helping me because I got a little mm -hmm. bit concerned and for people like just genuine innocent people because you said they use false love mm -hmm. i mean i'm sure you can get sucked in to that love and feel mm -hmm. like oh they adore me they love me and if that can continue on i mean you said i heard you say 30 years that's how long i've been married i mean if that can continue on that long is that something that can oh, happen. So yeah. it's not and, and always that they're mean inside the house. No, no, it, it can vary. I mean, it's it's always the passive aggressive, the silent treatment, the ghosting. There's always that. Again, that passive aggressive level. But um, you know, narcissists can have fun. People are like, but we went on great vacations. I'm like, yeah, but you know, was a vacation all about them? Were you allowed to really do what you want? Oh right. no. Okay. You know, so it is something where, where, um, you know, th there's a line, there's a spectrum, not all narcissists personally beat people, hurt them physically. Right. Some do, right. Some are a little bit liars and some are always lying. Some cheat, some always cheat. So there's the spectrum. And so people are like, well, mine never cheated. So I don't have that. Well, okay, there's some that just aren't that way and some that are. And so, um, you know, it's it's really understanding all of the things and knowing they're on a spectrum so that you're not just as clean. Right. Going, no, that's not him. I'm good. Um, because these are these are things they they hurt people. And um, you have to understand that during divorce, something happens we call a narcissistic injury. Um, so whether they decided or you decided, basically you go from all good to all evil. Black and white thing is what it's called, where they are just, you know, you are the devil spawn. I have one client she's been married for 49 years to him. And the reason that marriages last that long with a narcissist is it's a cover, makes them look like a normal person in the society, but it's also dependent on the victim. If the victim tolerates someone not listening to their boundaries, I didn't know what a boundary was. Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah, I'm, I'm still learning that. 
<laughs> so again, it, it's it's based on what the victim will tolerate. Um, very often they choose spiritual or religious people because they forgive and forget. Mm. So it's forgive me again, forgive me again. It's part of the game. So um, those are kind of the the the, the fat the, the kind of basic stuff. But they, you know, they stalk people. They they buy. They call child protective services a hundred times more than a normal person would, and, and always false allegations. Um, they call the police and have people arrested. The the jerk that had me arrested, I ended up having to reach out to his ex wife afterwards. And she said he'd arrested her three times. Oh. So it's just a tactic. If you're, if that's the kind of person, like Spectrum, ninety-nine percent are going to do it. But if it's what, oh, that worked well, they're going right. to keep on doing it to everybody that gets in their way that they want to get rid of. Right. Right. Okay. And so what I'm kind of hearing though, that a big part, a big piece of this is the self-absorption. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that I think most people can recognize. I mean, do you think that's maybe a first clue for people? I know that like looking at all of the, do, is that what you think? I mean, the, the self-absorption is certainly it. Um, but what that means is that they don't really care about their children, that they really don't care about you. Right. Um, and they don't care if you have right. nowhere to leave or you're going to be bankrupt after a long divorce. They don't care. So that self-absorption is it's all about me. I want this. I want the kitchen aid, whatever it is. Um, that's their, their modality for sure. Okay. So now this is kind of a tough question for me because I'm an attorney churn mediator and I love to help people work through a divorce together. One thing I'm thinking of is I want to be able to spot and see, ooh, is this person a narcissist? Even if the other party doesn't know. And then my next question kind of tied to this is, can a narcissist do a successful mediation? Or do you have to fight it out in court? Um, you know, I've had a, a few people do mediation that worked. I'm not saying a few people that have had it. I would say 97% it doesn't work okay. um, because they, they nothing is fair. It's never enough. They want more. They want more. Um, you know, the few that have, um, you know, succumbed to settling in a mediation are generally the ones who are being given a very big offer and then mm -hmm. they'll take it and go away. Um, but for the most part, it's it's a dangerous thing. They're the kinds that will just say no to everything. They come to mediation without a, yes. an, a, a speck of actually cooperating and thinking through things. They're just there because now you're the enemy. Remember, black and white thinking. So right. those are how you would identify it. Because if you were married for 10, 20, 30 years, they should have compassion for you. So that is the biggest sign that someone is not a narcissist, that someone is a narcissist, is that they have absolutely no compassion for this person they slept next to her for 30 years. Right. You know, <coughs> that's that's very helpful. Um, and, you know, sadly, a, a lot of my court ordered mediations where the judges are saying you need to go through mediation. That's where I see more of that personality. Then in general, I love my clients. They come to me and they want to work together. And that probably isn't going to fit the persona of a narcissist. Mm -hmm. So so that is very, very helpful. And now I've asked my questions and I'm so thankful for my brave client that we're just calling Lisa's client who's been quietly sitting here listening and she um, is going through this right now, and she has some great questions for Tracy. So welcome, Lisa's client, and please feel free to ask Tracy your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I just want to say that I'm so grateful for, the, for this community and Tracy, you know, for being out there and putting yourself and allowing people like us to, to learn, right? You paved the way. So thank you. Thank you. In my uh, one phase that of uh, journey that I'm going through, the one biggest thing that I'm kind of struggling with is, and it kind of really stems off the cover of your book, <laughs> <laughs> the tricks and the stuff that they're making, you know, they're doing. How do you deal with the triggers? You know, I'm a pretty strong person. I can deal with a lot of stuff, but, you know, they're outlandish. Yeah. St stealing yeah. assets and, you know, police reports and scare tactics and. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, 
every time I go, you have got to be kidding. So stonewalling, just, I mean, all of these, but the, yeah, police reports. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just want to say I was giggling because Tracy held up her little button. If you're listening and not seeing this on YouTube and it says you can't make this shit up. So I wasn't laughing at what the client was saying. That was a little bit of a humorous moment here on camera. <laughs> Very true, though. All right. So how do we deal um, when they when they they have these outlandish things, um, you know, the first thing is we can't control what they're going to say or do. And so for us, we have to manage how we respond to them. And you mentioned triggers. And that's one of the first thing I help clients with is learning to manage your triggers so that what they do doesn't get to you. Um, it's almost like a, you know, could have had a V8. I'm smacking my head. Oh, of course they're going to do that. That's what they're going to do. It's like out of the rule book. It's, it's amazing how similar every case is. They do a B C D yeah. and they're just all over the place. Right. So, um, you know, when, when a narcissist, you have to realize why they're doing this, right? They know your triggers. They know exactly what the most important thing is for you. Um, so if you're a great mom, they're going to attack that you're a bad mom, right? They're going to attack that you're a thief. If you're like the, the I was the bookkeeper and I'd kept all the books in. Oh my goodness, there's a $2 toll that wasn't ours. We should call them. I was really good about that. But then I got accused of controlling the money and, and blah, 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 you know. So they're always going to use your greatest strengths. So in some ways, one way to kind of like learn to manage this is, you know, what our fight and flight gets you know, kind of stuck in here. When they do that, we shut down. So when we shut down because we've been triggered or they're doing another tactic that is outrageous, um, we have to understand that that's their goal. So their goal is to shut you down. So our goal is to not let them shut us down because that's their game. So knowing that it's just a game and, you know, people are like, oh, no, I'm a good mother. They know I am. And I'm like, yeah, they probably do. They can't admit it because that doesn't align with their goals for the divorce, which is to not pay as much money or not, you know, all the different factors that come into it. But knowing what it is, is half the battle. So you learn to manage your triggers. And um, I have a, an amazing processing your trigger journal on my website that helps you go through the steps so that once you've written it into a journal a couple of times following these steps, you're not going to let them hijack your emotions. That's what their goal is, is to hijack your emotions. So learning to respond to that. I mean, the things of, uh, you know, stolen assets, police reports, stonewalling. I have a piece of paper from my divorce <laughs> that is literally the final decree. My husband was in contempt seven, six out of seven trials for never handing in any paperwork. So talk about stonewalling. He'd fly from New York and just not bring anything and accuse me of missing page nine of a blank Amex statement. And that would be a whole trial, even though he didn't produce anything. Of course, they're going to stonewall, right? They're going to hold everything up because it's costing you more money. So again, what is the goal of what they're doing? And then again, not letting it get inside of you because if they tell you you're a bad parent or they're telling the court you're a bad parent you're going to want to stand up and defend yourself right. cha-ching cha-ching more money let your lawyer decide what the most important things are that you have to fight you know stolen assets fine when you when that happens you get to work proving what they've taken so that you get your half back right it's it's not it's it's they knock you off track so that they can you know walk all over you but if you go, oh, that's what they're doing. Let me get those stolen assets documented so we have representation in court to fight that battle. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yes, I, I document, document, document. So <laughs> as well. And it Good. sounds like, Tracy, you're saying prepare yourself. Like before you go in, do the homework from that sheet um, that you have on your website and be prepared that they are going to try to get to you so that you're aware. Right, right. And, and again, having a coach or a therapist along the way to learn to regulate your emotions, because I can't tell you how many clients get on the screen. This is what they did today. You know, and the first thing I do before 
dealing with what they just did today is going, let's calm you. Let's give you the skills to know what and why they're doing it. Um, because that takes out some of the sting, right? We need to have that to protect ourselves. Good. Thank you very much. Um, another question that I have that, you know, I pondering all the time is when is it, when's it, when's enough is enough to like say, okay, now we need to go to court. We've had, you know, one unproductive mediation, not with Lisa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, they've been silent for eight weeks and now they wanted to do a moderated settlement conference. So it's like you were talking about the 97% that don't, you know, do very well in mediation. How do you, how do you start that decision-making process of? Well, the first thing, uh, and, and it alerted me when you said the stonewalling and all of that, that they're not producing all the records. You don't even know where the 401k is. Never, ever, ever, ever go to mediation without knowing everything that's on the table for one thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one unproductive three-hour um, mediation is is just a start, but it's it's also showing the light of how they will be. Right. And so okay. you have to turn it around to what did I want to accomplish in this set? Let's say we go to the settlement conference. That's one last chance for you to do it before you pay one hundred thousand dollars to go to court. Right. Yeah. So it's worth trying that. And certainly with Lisa here, she can guide you in, in a hopefully more productive way. But, um, you know, the pulling the plug and just saying, OK, we'll go to court in this case. Three hours is not a lot. I've had people in, you know, 12 hour, 15 hour mediations and nothing gets done on those. After that amount of time, they're just mm -hmm. not willing to negotiate. And okay. that's what we have to come to terms with, because, you know, if they're not going to play, then you want to go into court with a really strong parenting plan and a really strong what you want so that the judge is going to base his decisions off what you're asking for. And that will help make it smoother when you get to court. But pulling the plug is, is a personal decision. But if you ha don't have all the facts, don't do it. If they're not willing to do anything and they just sit there like minded, crossing his arms, no, 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 nothing. Eight hours, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. It's not worth it. Um, and, but okay. you do risk more going into the courtroom. Okay. So I'd go for the moderated settlement first. Or even maybe one more mediation before the moderated settlement is what mm -hmm. I've got going in my brain. So yeah, that could work. Okay. But and set your goals, make sure you have goals that if they don't agree on A, B, and C, like if you've got kids, we want to get half of what should be achieved in this next mediation or I'm not coming back. So make sure you have something in your head of where the line is. Well, and that's a perfect segue to my next question is, um, you know, what do I want? What's fair? What's right? I know that that's not the key word I should be saying. No fair. <laughs> but how do you, how do you, when do you come to that decision making or how to, you know, to say, okay, move on. I don't want that. I want this though. Um, stop, I, just stop fighting because they continue to not, I mean, he, I, I was, I was given the first proposal of he was going to take everything and I got nothing. So then, you know, I'm like, do I really want to fight for this? How far, you know, can we come in the middle? Because it's so far apart. So are you talking about marital assets and property and things like that? Pretty much, uh, yes, everything, uh, real property, marital property, you know, uh, he's he's removed so much from the house, um, you know, all of very much sentimental artwork, pictures, uh, you know, uh, joint marital property. We have 401ks, we have pensions, we have, um, it, so. We've got stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, we, have a, we don't have a lot. We're middle income, regular people, but, you know, when it comes down to it, it's like, I, I, I want, I want the house. I know I can afford it. I've gone through all of those details of, um, you know, really, should you have it? Can you afford it? I've done all my homework there. I really want that. But the rest of it, you know, it's like, how much do I fight? When do I kind of stop? Do I push all the personal property? You go have that. And I know Lisa and I've talked about this, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, you could have so many, so many negotiations of, okay, you have this, you have this. When do you know 
in your heart that something's not worth it. Right. Well, I'll use the example of a KitchenAid, which is so small compared to everything you're talking about. <laughs> but if the KitchenAid costs less than it would to fight over it, it's not worth fighting for, right? right? A pension, the house, the children, you know, the 401k. Don't believe a narcissist if that's the only thing you take away from this conversation is they're just intimidating you. They want it all. You're getting nothing. You didn't really work. You're not getting anything. It's mine. It's not yours, right? All of that like grandiosity of, of their entitlement to everything is not true. But again, this is how they keep, this is gaslighting 101. And this is how mm -hmm. they keep a victim trapped by not really, you know, letting them know what their options are. So most people will fall and just be like, oh, okay, I don't get anything. All right, I'll take this much, right? Because they are used to being manipulated. And in most cases, if they the other parent was a stay-at-home person or made less than them, they've been told so often that they're not entitled to it, that this isn't yours, this is mine. Marital property is marital property. Everything in, in this case is marital property, except for inheritances. So you are entitled to it. And I would fight like hell to make sure you got your share of it because right. his mediate, his, his whole concept is to sit there and scare you right. into not fighting for what is yours. And a court will tell you, you get half. Absolutely. I love that. The court will tell you that you get half. And then as far as I think fighting over little tiddly things, look in your heart and think, do I really need this? Do I want this? Is it worth the fight? And like Tracy was saying, you know, is it worth what it's going to cost to fight for it? The KitchenAid. I think that is so, so such good advice. And also I think there's something to be said for, you know, while there he's going, I want all of it, right? There's nothing wrong with you saying, you know what? I want it all. Screw you. I want half of that, <laughs> half of that. And then, you know, if you really don't care about the the you know living room set down in the basement, okay. you know what? I'll give that back, but you give me this. I'll give that. You use the pieces to negotiate back to a higher level rather than letting them control the narrative and right. tell you what you can take. If they negotiate right now, I'm, you know, there's no conversation. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and again, so. having, having no conversation. Um, and again, that's not how the court is going to work, but okay. he's sitting there trying to tell you that so that you sit there in fear and worry, but, you know, go, go with your highest number and go with, you know, if it comes to personal property, like that, you know, the, the, the living room set and the TV in there and all these little chachi things, right? If we, if we just look at those things, you can also say, you know, I don't really want the couch, the TV and the, then the dresser, but if you take them, I get half the money. Don't forget that piece of it because often, you know, you're like, Okay, I'll give it to him. You think you're making peace and you're like, then they'll be nicer to you. No, he's just showing you what the bargaining chips are and take them all and then give back one or two rather than let him control that. And I know you're you're in this negotiation thing, but again, a courtroom is going to be different mm -hmm. and take what you can into the next mediation, set a time limit. If you know, if we yeah. are not one okay. tiny point in three hours, I'm out of here. Yeah. Well, and I remember you saying, you know, I spent a hundred thousand dollars on 25,000, you know, and, and it's, it's not the furniture and all that stuff. It's, he's got stuff. We'll just say, we're going to keep it vague, um, which is about $20,000 worth of stuff. Majority of that, that's the stuff that he's removed from the house and said, I stole. Right. So but having I, evidence about them, even if you can like go back and find a picture that was like the I got a painting on the wall, I again, the judge will make him accountable for these things. So um, if it doesn't happen in, in, in mediation, you have all that evidence. That's what you've got to bring to court is the evidence of the things that he's saying never existed. Okay, I'm happy right now. Um, and the, the the one last thing that I should have put on my notes is narc proofing your divorce decree part mm. in your book. Probably yes. one of my, I think I've read that section 
multiple, multiple times. I have, I probably have about five or six that I've, you know, sanctioned uh, to put into my decree as well. But um, talk a little bit about that because I think you are the only one who really talks about that in this community of um, divorce. Yeah. <laughs> So I don't know what to call it. <laughs> so, you know, like the regular lawyers um, call it bookending things. So again, if, if Christmas, it doesn't have anything in it, a narcissist will exploit it. And I use that you've read it six times. So you'll know I use the example of, of, you know, the first Christmas was the father's. And he picked up the kids and then didn't bring them back um, for the entire like week and a half, two weeks. I forget what it was now. Um, and the woman, the mother's like calling the police, you know, he's supposed to have them for Christmas and it's two weeks later, where's my kids? But the, the officer said, you know, I'm sorry, ma'am, but it doesn't say when it ends. And so I started to put this together. I've gone to contempt of court hearings with clients and went, oh, you can add something like that to your decree. Funny, I don't ever see it in decrees, but the judge said, why don't we make sure we get that thing in there? Right. So knowing that the narc proofing is really making sure that everything has a date and a, um, you know, a time and if he's supposed to pay you payments. Okay. So let's just say you're entitled to $300,000 somehow from all the investments or whatever. Right. Um, if it just says he'll sell uh, one of the rental houses and, and, and give you the 300,000, mm -hmm. but it doesn't say when, that has to be accomplished by. And that was one of the the, the stories in the book with a yep. friend of mine, I went to her contempt court hearing and it was two years later and she had spent $20,000 just to fight for what he was ordered to give her, right? So had there been a deadline on that clause, mm -hmm. it would have made it a lot simpler. Um, same thing with children things. Everything is mapped out to the nth, the detail and it might be even harder to fight for it but i equate it to how much did you spend on your wedding dress <laughs> how much did you spend on your flowers oh those were for a whole day did they last for 20 years if you've got children you are bargaining and negotiating for the next 18 years it is worth whatever you have to spend to fight for the details that this gray areas of the divorce decree are i work with clients that are coming to me post-divorce going, oh my God, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. What do I do? What do I do? Right. And every time I learn from them what they need to do. And so that's what this whole section in the book is, because if we don't narc proof it, they just see the gray and they just like yeah. make up their own rules. And then if it's not in there, but let's say it, it, he had to sell that $300,000 house by December 31st and give you the money by January 31st and he doesn't, that's called contempt of court. Mm -hmm. Before it was a, oops, you didn't get that in your decree, ma'am. Sorry. Now you've got evidence that has dates. And if they pass them, you can take, you can take action on those. Sure. And I think that is great information for the attorney representing these clients to, I mean, they have to be on their toes and they have to know what that means to narc proof. And so, I mean, I think your book, I hope a lot of attorneys are reading your book because it's so impactful. And I got so, one for my lawyer. <laughs> did you, I did. did you give it to your lawyer? Did you say client of mine? Yes, I bought one for my lawyer. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's something that, again, people that, you know, just do divorces um, that aren't doing them with a narcissist. A normal decree says you get them Christmas this year. I get them Christmas next year. Have a nice day. But a narcissist, as we used that example before, will exploit it. They will sit there just to make it miserable for you. It didn't say I have to pay for braces. It just said maybe if I wanted to. So I don't and I'm not. So, put, you know, it's like a little kid. So you have to give them strong boundaries. And that's what your decree is. It is the most important boundary document you will ever have. And it's great practice for setting boundaries in your future, right? It's going to make you, client, a stronger, more powerful person when you enter into a new relationship because you're going to learn how to do boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
So yeah. even this is an opportunity. Right? <laughs> You're like, I don't want opportunities to learn. I just wanted this to be over. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, I have to say it is time to kind of wind things down. And I am sitting here with so much gratitude that I have this amazing client that's able to get coached by this amazing woman, Tracy Malone. I'm so thankful that you were here. And Tracy, as we wind down in my podcast, I have what's called the saddle up segment. Now, here's the deal. You've given us so many tips, and <laughs> but I know you have so much available. And one of them would be to read your book. I mean, it is. It's amazing. But if there is one little piece of information that you could hand over to my listeners today to help them moving along, can you give us that? Well, the first thing is probably to protect yourself um, emotionally through this process. It's going to be a big, long, painful journey. The second part is not to give up hope. Um, you know, it might feel really hopeless. Like there's just no way this he's going to agree. It's not about him agreeing, right? It's 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 having that. But for yourself, it is it is to know that this will end one day. And, you know, even if you don't get what you wanted, you are free and you're able to start all over again. And, and I'm not saying you have to go and marry someone else. I'm saying you get to live your life and not have that kind of abuse in it. And the, the third thing I would say is to make sure that you have as much detail into that decree so that those laws are now law that if they violate them, um, I have another thing in the book that doesn't get talked about, but it's, I think the most important thing, it's called the, what if they don't clause? And I made that name up. So most lawyers are like, what the hell is that? <laughs> but it is it is basically a, a clause that um, I had a lawyer write for me that basically there's always that paragraph. Both parties are responsible for their legal fees, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah, this okay. one says that line. But it also says that in the event that either party, not just him or you, um, either party doesn't comply with the orders above, like they didn't sell that $300,000 house, they will be responsible to pay your legal fees. And that's what going to that one hearing with my client um, and the judge said, I would love to, but it wasn't in the first decree. Get that in. Because if you are worried about post-divorce abuse, this is going to stop them because now they're paying your bills, right? It's a lot easier to know that that's on your side if you can get that in. And it's, it's written in a way that is for either party so that they don't take quite as much offense to it. If it was just that person, no, it's, if I screw up too and I don't do it, I will pay your legal fees, you know? So it works out and it, it's a lot easier to slip in there. So those are my closing tips. Thank you for bringing that up because I think that's important to have in any divorce. Any divorce. So that's so, I mean, yeah, that is an amazing, amazing, helpful little tidbit. Three of them you gave us. So now, Tracy Malone, what do you think of when you think of doing divorce different? Um, I think with a narcissist, uh, doing divorce differently is getting through it and getting through it mentally in a better place than you would get support get people that are going to help you join support groups. You're not alone. Um, that's something I didn't have when I went through mine. And I, I just look at all the, the resources that are out there now that would have made my journey a lot more smooth. And I probably wouldn't have had PTSD and ended up with the next jerk, right? So it is it is about knowing and, and healing your wounds. Like that's what people don't understand. Uh, being with a narcissist created wounds, but so did the divorce process. And so if you just go, okay, divorce is over. I'm ready. Let me go dates. My friends tell me to get back on the horse. You know, if that is the situation, then you're probably not ready and be really mindful to heal those wounds. Because if you don't know how to set boundaries, you're going to attract someone else who doesn't set boundaries. It doesn't allow you to set boundaries. If you don't know how to, you know, trust again, you're going to have people that are not trustworthy come into your life. You have to set that, you know, it's boundaries and you have to have a trust like platform so that you can get out into the world in a healthier place. So don't think because it's over, you're all healed. Look at the wounds, heal the wounds, and then you're ready to get back to your life. 
So, so good. Tracy, thank you so much for taking something really painful that you went through and helping the world. I mean, you really do have resources that nobody else does. Mm -hmm. And so we, my client, myself, all the listeners appreciate you. And if people want to find you, where's a great way to do that? We'll have it in the show notes, but where can people connect with you for coaching or your resources or your book? Um, so my website is NarcissistAbuseSupport.com and um, I have I have links to, you know, financial aid services. I have links to domestic violence. There's so much on my website. Um, and again, links to support groups, links to blogs, links to strategies and worksheets and all kinds of stuff. So it's all there. You can find it. And again, all my socials off of there and my Facebook group is off of there. So um, there's plenty of support and um, find me there. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks for being here, both of you. Take care. Thank you.